Hello everyone, we're reading From Hand to Mouth by James Cross Giblin, and we're on chapter four, The Quick Little Fellows. No one knows exactly when the Chinese began to use chopsticks, but some say it was greedy people who thought of them first. According to this story, it happened at the beginning of Chinese written history, around 3000 BC, when most people cooked their foods in tripods. These were metal pots that stood on three squat legs and could be set directly over a fire. The large pots took an hour or so to cool after the food was cooked, and some people were too greedy to wait. Grabbing a pair of sticks, they poked at the steaming food and lifted out the best pieces for themselves. Others copied them, and within a short time, people all over China were eating with chopsticks. Another explanation credits the Chinese preference for the chopsticks over knives to the ph philosopher Confucius who lived from 551 to 479 BC. Confucius once remarked that <clears throat> honorable and upright people would rather see an animal alive than dead. And if they heard the noise and screams of an animal being killed, they would not want to eat its flesh. For Confucius, knives were a constant reminder of such killings. Consequently, he wrote in one of his books, the honorable and upright man keeps well away from both the slaughterhouse and the kitchen, and he allows no knives on his table. Whether or not Confucius was responsible, we do know that by 400 BC, people throughout China were using chopsticks. Hand in hand with their adoption came the development of uniquely Chinese style of cooking. Meat and vegetables were either cut into bite-sized pieces or cooked until they were so turner, tender that they required no cutting. Mom, Joey's around in you. I understand. I'm reading a book right now. He's around in you. You can sit with me if you want. Even when poultry and fish were served whole, the meat was so tender that it could be picked easily off the bones with a pair of chopsticks. Besides chopsticks, the Chinese from very early in their history also used spoons. They were made of a hard earth earthenware called porcelain, and they had flat bottoms so that a diner could set one down on a tabletop without spilling the contents. The Chinese thought the round-bottomed European spoon was very inefficient. Unlike Europeans, the Chinese never used their spoons to eat any food except soup. For everything else, they used chopsticks, manipulating the two sticks smoothly and quickly as they plucked bits of food from what, first one dish and then another. In fact, the word for chopsticks in Chinese means the quick little fellows. Most Chinese chopsticks are 10 to 12 inches long and is about as thick as a pencil. Those for children can be as short as 5 inches. Those used by the hostess or host to pass special delicacies to their guests are sometimes as long as 20 inches. That's very long. Chopsticks have also been made from many different materials over the centuries. Bamboo, wood, jade, ivory, gold, and silver. Many upper class families in old China used ivory chopsticks tipped with silver. Since ancient times, the Chinese have believed that silver was a protection against poison. If the silver-tipped chopsticks came into contact with food that had been poisoned, they would turn black, or so people said. Only the wealthiest Chinese families could afford gold or silver chopsticks, and one had to have very strong fingers to use them, for they were extremely heavy. In the classic Chinese novel, The Dream of the Green, the Red Chamber, sorry, The Dream of the Red Chamber, the fact be became embarrassingly clear to a peasant girl who was dining in a wealthy home for the first time. When she tried to pick up a pigeon's egg with her gold chopsticks, she was so startled by their weight that she dropped the egg on the floor. In setting a Chinese table, the chopsticks are placed either to the right or below a small central plate. The soup bowl is located to the upper right of the plate with the flat bottom spoon, soup spoon in it. A bowl of rice served with every Chinese meal is put directly on the plate. I'm going to go back to show you this picture. It's a photo of Chinese workers eating rice with chopsticks at Kunming Air Base, 1944, courtesy of the New York Public Library Picture Collection. At Chinese banquets, the meat and vegetable dishes are served one after another, and the guests help themselves to portions of each, putting them on their small plates. The soup is served last. At family dinners, all the dishes are in the middle of the table at the beginning of the meal, with the soup tureen in the center. A single pair of chopsticks is used to eat all the dishes, even at banquets. Often the diners are provided with small rests of porcelain on which they can lay their chopsticks between courses so they won't soil the tablecloth. 
chopsticks serve as signals during a Chinese meal. At the start, the host raises his chopsticks over his rice bowl to invite the guests to begin eating. He, then he puts his rice bowl to one side of the plate and all the other diners do the same. At the end of the meal, the diners set their chopsticks even and parallel across the tops of their rice bowls to indicate that they've finished. Chopsticks often seem awkward to handle at first, even for Chinese children, but when you learn how to hold them firmly but lightly, there's no strain at all and their use quickly becomes second nature. To begin, hold your right hand or your left if you're left-handed in a relaxed position. Place the first chopstick between the tip of your fourth or ring finger and the base of your thumb. You see what I'm doing? Be sure you pick up the chopstick the right way. The top half, which you hold in your hand, is squared. The tip, which takes up the food, is rounded, or, and it's skinnier. Your thumb should be across, uh, excuse me, around the squared section and your ring finger at the midpoint of the chopstick. Oh, I see, so they're going like this. You'll see when I show you the picture. Brace the chopstick against the fourth finger with the middle of the thumb, but keep the tip of the thumb free. You'll need it to hold up the second chopstick. This is hard for me to show you without holding chopsticks in my hand. I wish I'd thought of bringing some out. Place the second stick between your thumb tip and the tips of your index and middle fingers. Grasp the stick lightly so you can move it up and down against the other chopstick, which remains still. Keep that in mind. One of the chopsticks remains still. If you have someone in your family that's good at using chopsticks, they can show you that but you learn as you work with it that only the top stick goes up and down. Are you going inside? Will you grab me some chopsticks, please? A set that matches, thank you. When you want to pick up a piece of food, push upward on the second chopstick with your middle finger. This will open the tips of the chopsticks. To grasp the food, push down on the second stick with the same middle finger. The two chopsticks will come together with the food pinched securely between the two tips. Then you can raise the bite swiftly to your mouth. I don't expect that listening to this will help you learn. It's easier to watch and learn, but some people might be able to do it listening to these words. We'll see. It's important to keep the tips of the chopsticks even with one another at all times. If one is higher and one is lower, the chopsticks will not work. Here's a picture of how to hold them. Thank you. Okay, I'm no pro with this, but I can show you how I hold them. And we'll see. Okay, here are the chopsticks in my hand. I'm looking down to see, they have this finger on there too, the ring finger they talked about. And then when I use them, I just move the top one open and shut. And they're saying to make sure that these two are always even when you're working. And when you pick something up, you're just, I'm not looking very good at it right now. Okay, I guess I do put my ring finger there because then you go to pick something up. Let me see if there's something I can pick up. I don't know what this is. Piece of cloth I found on the ground. <laughs> Hi, Piggy. So that's it. See how the top one moves and the bottom one stays still. I think that's key if you look at it from this side. But I'm sure that your family member might be able to show you or there's probably other videos you can look at with people that are better at it than me. I got these chopsticks at a restaurant called Jumbo in... Uh, Hong Kong with my grandmother when I was 16 years old. That's a story for another day, but it's a good one. Remind me, I'll try to remember when I see you next and I'll tell you the story in person of why I got to go to Hong Kong when I was 16 with my grandmother. Rice is hard to eat with chopsticks because the individual grains are so small. However, the Chinese have found a solution to this problem. They lift the rice bowl with their thumb resting on the rim and their index and middle fingers grasping the bottom. Then holding the bowl quite close to the mouth, they use their chopsticks to transfer globs of rice from the bowl to the mouth. When they get near the bottom of the bowl, they raise it to the lips in a drinking position and scoop out the last few grains. That's sort of like the picture that we just looked at. Let me see if I can get back to it. Yep, see that person raising the bowl up to his lips and he's just shoveling the last bits into his mouth. The use of chopsticks spread from China to the neighboring countries of Vietnam and Korea. Eventually, like many other Chinese customs, it also reached Japan. This occurred sometime before AD 500, and within a short time, people throughout the Japanese islands were eating with chopsticks. The Japanese called their chopsticks hashi, meaning bridge, because the sticks act as a bridge between the bowl and the mouth. Japanese chopsticks offered, sorry, differed somewhat from the Chinese variety. They had tapered rather than rounded ends, 
and were most often made of lacquered wood instead of bamboo or ivory. Lacquer is obtained from the juice of a tree pe peculiar to the Far East and is purified by filtering. The lacquer, which may be colored, is then applied to chopsticks or other wooden objects in several successive layers. After the lacquer dries, the chopsticks are rubbed down to give them a smooth, shiny surface. If the layers, layers of lacquer are thick enough, they can be carved, painted, or engraved. Many lacquered Chinese, sorry, many lacquered Japanese chopsticks feature beautiful inlaid designs of gilt or mother of pearl. Besides their use at the table, chopsticks also play a role in the cremation ceremonies of Japanese Buddhists. This has led to certain dining taboos. For example, a Japanese never passes food to another person with his own chopsticks. This might remind the person of the Buddhist ritual in which bone fragments of the deceased are picked from the funeral pyre with ceremonial chopsticks and passed among the family members. The Japanese never stick their chopsticks upright in a bowl of rice either, since that action also is a con connection with death. Buddhist mourners customarily p place a bowl of uncooked rice by the family altar as an offering to the deceased and then stand his chopsticks upright in it. The Japanese observe other taboos when using chopsticks. If they go on a picnic, they take along disposable wooden chopsticks and always break them in two when they finished eating. Otherwise, they believe a wily devil might find the chopsticks and use them for evil, some evil purpose. Basically though, the Japanese handle their chopsticks in the same way that the Chinese do, and they've done so for centuries. When a merchant from Italy, Francesco Carletti, visited Japan at the end of the 1500s, he wrote in his journal about the natives' skillful use of chopsticks. Here's a picture of a 19th century Japanese family at dinner. It looks like an etching, courtesy of the Cooper Hewitt Museum Smithsonian Institution. They are the length of a man's hand and as thick as a quill for writing, wrote Carletti. With these two sticks, the Japanese are able to fill their mouths with marvelous swiftness and agility. They can pick up any piece of food, no matter how tiny it is, with ever, without ever soiling their hands. Carletti was writing at a time when most Europeans still ate with their fingers, but that would soon change. A new utensil was about to be introduced on dinner tables from Italy to England. This utensil would enable Europeans to eat their food as neatly and cleanly as the Japanese diners Carletti had observed. Eventually, it would revolutionize Western table manners. What was this wonder-working utensil? The common fork. All right, the fork comes to the table in chapter five. See you next time.